Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the trade hacker mindset. All right, I want to welcome Dr. Gary Dayton to the podcast. Gary is the founder and president of Peak Psychology, Inc. He has a doctorate in clinical psychology. He also authors the book called Trade Mindfully, Achieve Your Optimum Trading Performance with Mindfulness and Cutting Edge Psychology. Gary, welcome to the program, and please tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Hi, thanks, Steve. Thanks for that nice introduction. Well, Steve says I'm, I'm trained as a psychologist. I have a doctorate in clinical psychology, and I worked with patients with all kinds of um, psychological and psychiatric disorders, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, addictive disorders. But I was also um, lucky, I think, to have been able to work with somebody who was a sports psychologist. He happened to be a professor at our university. He was a part-time uh, fellow. And uh, he uh, was the sports psychologist for some of the you know, like the Cleveland Indians, Major League Baseball team, the uh, Cavaliers and uh, basketball teams, a serious um, uh, sports psychologist. And I got to train with him for a couple of years um, in that. And I was able to, and we actually worked with him on this, to take some of the sports psychology modeling and bring it into trading. Um, which is what my book, Trade Mindfully, is about, uh, also using mindfulness practices, which are really, really important. And on top of being a psychologist, I'm also a trader. I've been trading since um, 1998 or 1999, and um, trade what's known as the Wyckoff method, which is just reading price action with volume. Uh, and primarily a day trader, although I've traded pretty much all the different markets. My main focus is trading the S&P E-mini on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a little bit about me. And are you, uh, that's great, are you trading just first couple hours of the day? Or are you kind of watching it all day long? What, what's, your, what's, your, what's your style or kind of how long are you trading it? Yeah, I like to be done by noontime if I can. So I usually get in about an hour before the um, U.S. session opens. There's good trading in that, what I call the pre-market. Um, and then the morning session is usually a good um, good time for, often for counter trend moves or, uh, you know, swings back and forth. We'll typically get one or two good swings in the morning. Now, if we get a good trend day going, one that opens on one side of the market and closes on the other, I'll hang around for the afternoon because those don't come up all that often. And they can generally be pretty powerful in afternoons in the S&Ps and in most most vehicles, um, we see trending action more frequently than we see in the morning. Right. And you, you mentioned Wyckoff method. You mentioned uh, price action and volume. Do you have a specific time frame on your charts that you use, or are you using multiple time frames? Oh, you got to use multiple time frames. Um, I will look at the daily, the hourly, the 240 minute or the four hour. Uh, the 15 minute and the five minute. On my screen is the hourly 15 and uh, five minute charts. Those are the primary ones that I look at. So you're utilizing higher time frames to get an idea of trend or direction, and then you're executing based on the five minute. Is that kind of a little bit? Kind of, yeah. I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> if you look at any daily chart of the S and P's or any market for that matter. You will see, and I encourage folks to do this because it is eye-opening if you've never seen this before. You will see that almost every day that the current day is trading at or around yesterday's high or the two-day low or something along those lines. Yesterday's high is where the market stopped and two-day low is where the you know sellers where the buyers came in and overcame the sellers. So those are going to be important um, levels and often have residual support and resistance characteristics 
certainly the next day and sometimes for several days after that. So, yeah, I'm really keyed into the higher time frame, support and resistance, how it's been trading. Um, and that often informs me of how to trade the next day. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, we uh, in our day trading room, we we don't trade the Wyckoff method. I'm, I'm familiar with the high level concepts of that methodology, but we trade price action. We trade using volume and we use previous days, high, low, open and close as some very key levels. So it's just kind of interesting how, you know, different different methodologies can kind of tie together. And obviously it's all part of the market structure. So that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. Market structure. That's the king pin to any trading, I think, is understanding structure. Very cool. Well, Gary, I want to I want to jump into some things that I think will be very beneficial to our audience. Obviously, the name of this podcast is called the Trade Hacker Mindset. So it's all about the mindset around trading. And I know that you're big on that, too, which is why I wanted you here. Um, but you, you've come up with a seven part guide to mental trading skills. And this is something that's available on your website. But I'd love to hit on each of those seven because I I think they're extremely important in, in helping people just have a routine, have a specific way that they go about creating the right mindset around trading. And so if you don't mind, let's let's jump into those, starting with number one, which is how to prepare for the trading day. So talk to, talk a little bit about how you prepare for your trading day. Sure. Well, I separate my process, my trading process into three parts, uh, before, during, and after, you know, real sophisticated here. And this comes out of uh, sports psychology. What we do before trading is we want to prepare. We want to prepare in a high quality way. What we do during trading is we want to execute effectively. And after trading is over, we want to assess how we did, how the market traded. So let's talk and I keep them separate because it's it's useful. You don't want to be looking for support and resistance uh, in the middle of your trading day. You want to know where that that is and where that's located um, and, and be clear about that. Same thing. You don't want to be. Oh, why did that trade not work out in the middle of a trading day that you set that aside for later on after the trading is over? You can then with a clear mind, take a look at that stuff. So bringing it back to preparation, so important, so important. We want to have a clear process for preparing. And I split it up into two things, market and mental. And on the market, I'm assessing today's trading, looking to see if that's going to inform me in any way what tomorrow might be. So for example, if we have a narrow range day, which we had a couple of days ago in the S&Ps after a rally up, <clears throat> It suggested that the buyers were tiring out. They were, they didn't, they shot their wad, so to speak. And we could potentially see a pullback because it's a narrow range day. A lot of consolidation happens. We could also see some trending conditions. So just starting off with assessing today's trading and thinking about how it's going to play out tomorrow is very useful. As we talked about, the higher time frame uh, support and resistance on the daily charts, really, really important. Also, here's something that traders can do. and You can actually get really good at this. Identify the location where you think that a trade will set up the next day in the morning or in the afternoon. And as I say, you can get pretty good at this, getting to the point where you could identify three out of the five days each week where a trade is likely to set up. And when it does, you know you're confident. You've you know, pinned that point and you can take that with some confidence. And when you say so, set up, are you are you talking about where a market might reverse? Well, yeah, might come down to a level and have um, a climactic action or some sort of exhaustion move there and then rally off of that. Or it might rally up and bump its head against resistance. Or it might go through and then come back to old what was old resistance ought to now be support, right? So those areas you can identify ahead of time. And knowing that you've got the landscape, or as, as we were talking about a few moments ago, the structure of the market. And I think the structure of the market is the number one thing to understand about 
technical analysis and trading it. So that's sort of on the on the on the um, technical side, but there's also the mental side. And, and before you move on to the mental side, I've heard sure. you say this before, and, and, and you, you kind of touched on it. And you said you don't want to be drawing these support and resistance and kind of figuring this out while you're trading. But I think you're a big advocate of even doing it, not even that morning before you start trading, but actually the night before. Oh yeah, well, the night generally my my personal routine is to do that the night before. Lay out, you know, see how the market traded, lay out the support and resistance. And then I'll come in, as I say, I come in usually an hour or so, hour and a half before the uh, U.S. opens, which is 9 Eastern time. So I get into the I get to my trading desk a little before eight o'clock in the morning. And what I do, <clears throat> I'm continuing my preparatory work at that point. I'm looking how the overnight is traded, um, looking for. Um, the overnight high and low usually gets set either in the Asian session or, or quite frequently in the European session. And those have meaning too, just like uh, daily high and low, those European and Asian session highs and lows are, are, are so I update my charts um, with that. Um, and after that's done, then I go on to the mental side. And the very first thing I do, I'll tell you three things that are that are very useful. Um, as part of my normal routine that anyone can adopt and, and use this with, with, um, with some effectiveness, because it's a good proven way of approaching the mental side of the market. First thing, number one, is meditation. And I tend to do that for 20, 30 minutes in the morning. Um, and we can talk a little bit about meditation, uh, if you like, in, in some detail. But I consider it the, probably the most potent mental technique that we have ever discovered. And it was discovered almost 3000 years ago. So it's a very, very useful thing. Let's let's talk about that for just a minute, because there, I think, you know, there are a lot of different theories around meditation. When you do it personally, I'm just I'm just curious how you do it. Are you mm -hmm. are you really just trying to clear your mind of everything? Or are you no. actually trying to focus on something market specific or something totally different? No, 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 none, none of the above. OK, good. None of the above. So in, in just real rudimentary terms, mindfulness, most most of the way it's practiced, there's a variety of different ways that it could be practiced. But most of the tried and true methods are focusing on the sensations of your breath. OK, so in other words, we take our attention and we light, we place it on, or we put it towards the coolness coming in through the in-breath, warmness coming out, a little tickle feeling at the nostrils, or maybe the belly rising and falling, the pressure uh, as, it, as it expands and, and as the abdomen. So that's what we focus on. And what we find is very fascinating to me is that no matter and, and you don't want to try hard to do this, but no matter how hard you try to focus on the breath, your mind starts to go wandering about. There was a phenomenal study that was done by a guy up in Harvard when he was a graduate student. I forget his name now, but he created a telephone app. And on the app, it listed three things. It said, what are you doing? Are you focused on what you're doing? And are you happy? And he would randomly ping people throughout the day, whoever signed up for this. And last time I checked, which now is a couple of years ago, had over 650,000 data points. So incredibly robust, wow. right? This is good, 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 solid research. Here's what he found. 49.7%, so 50% of the time, are, we're doing something, but our mind is not on what we're doing. It's off on something else. So what that says is, is that our mind is only randomly concentrated on the tasks, whatever the task at hand is that we're doing for reading a book or a magazine, for watching television, if we're preparing a meal, washing a dish, taking a trade setup. Doesn't matter. Half the time we're not focused on it. Okay. So my back to mindfulness, all mindfulness does is have us focus this form of mindfulness. You can get into more religious or spiritual kinds of things, 
That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm using it in a very practical, very pragmatic way that's useful for traders. We need to have incredibly good concentration, but we don't have it because we're human beings and the mind likes to go on walkabouts all the time. In fact, the neurologists call this the default mode of our brain's network. In other words, our brain is just kind of randomly bopping around. Our thoughts are just kind of randomly bopping around in there. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you, you experienced that too. I thought maybe I was the only one, so good. No, uh, and, and you know, <laughs> this is the other thing. We all experience this. No one is immune from it because we're humans. So mindfulness teaches us that, A, our thoughts really just kind of come and go on their own. Yeah, they can be triggered by events out in the environment, but or even events events inside the the environment inside your the, between your ears. There, uh, you get a, an image or a thought, and it will lead to other thoughts. But the point is, is that the thoughts come up, and this is true with feelings too. You start to notice this by meditating. They're just they're just coming and going as the, as they as they are. And we don't have to buy into them. People tend to hold their think their thoughts really, really close in. They're kind of looking at the world through this maze of, of thinking that's going on. Meditation allows us to kind of separate ourselves from our thoughts, hold those thoughts out at arm's length so we can see them and evaluate them rather than just obeying them or um, going with them. So mindfulness is incredibly important to do that. It's a, it's like building, you know, if you were, went to the gym and you wanted good biceps and a good chest, you'd have to be doing curls and, and push up. Um, what do they call those? The, the, uh, Bench chest press. Rate. yeah, presses. That's it. We'd have to be doing those, right? And we don't just go into the gym and say, oh, I'm fit now. We've got to spend a couple of months doing it. It's the same thing with mindfulness. It's an exercise. And what we're doing is exercising a skill of concentration in the mind. I'm so, so, I'm so excited that you brought that up. Sorry to interrupt. I'm so excited oh, you brought that up because I literally just recently started my trying to create a meditation type practice and I do it, I do it twice a day. And when I first started, because I've just, I've always felt like, man, I just, I can't, I'm not a good meditator. <laughs> it's kind of how I put it. And so, but what I did is I, I found kind of a program that I, that I thought I could follow. And, and so what I did is when I first started, I started doing it for three minutes. And in pretty close to what you're saying is I just focus on my breath and I did it for three minutes. And then every day I would try to, in, I would increase that by about 30 to 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so now I, like I said, I, I haven't been doing this very long, but today I'm at 17 minutes yeah, and I great. do that. I do that first thing in the morning when I, once I get to the office before I start trading and then I do it once, either when I get home later or before I leave the office. And so I'm doing it 17 minutes twice a day and it, it's amazing. And, I, and part of what you, and the way I describe it is pretty similar to what you're saying is it creates space, right? It creates space with your thoughts. It creates space in your mind instead of just having it, you know, like you said, right up in front of your face. So couldn't, right. could not agree more. So sorry to interrupt. Please continue. Oh, no worries. This is good. This is a fun conversation. This is the way an interview ought to be, right? Just kind of flowing along here. Yeah, so mindfulness is a really useful thing. Now, if I'm working on something, this, again, we're back now to the preparation, right? If I'm working on something, like let's say, for example, that um, I've been getting into trades, no problem getting into them, but I'm getting in early, right? I have to sit through, you know, the chop and what have you. And sometimes I get stopped out. It's uncomfortable. And so I want a better entry technique. And so I might have researched that and I might have come up with one or two ideas on that. And I tested it out and it looks and it seems pretty good from back testing. So now I want to put that in play. Right. So I'm going to rehearse that a little bit in my mind's eye before trading. And it, you don't have to do this long and it doesn't have to be, you know, um, some people think that they need to have super sharp mental images in their mind of you don't need that at all. You just need a suggestion of it. So I would close my eyes. I would do this for just a few minutes 
And I just I re, re, remember what I'm what I'm all about here. I want to take good entries, right? And then I would, in my mind's eye, I might pick a trade that I traded yesterday or a couple of days ago, and a good. I'd like it to be a successful trade, one that one that won. Um, and so I'll, I'll, watch, I'll just in my mind's eye, I can see the price coming down, and I wait for that entry. And when that when that triggers, I can see myself, you know, hitting the mouse, you know, pressing for the the button for the for the order to go in. And then I step back a little bit, and I, you know, set, I see myself setting the stop and all of that stuff that I normally do, and then managing the trade to its conclusion. So I do a little rehearsal of that. That's a nice reinforcement of things that I'm working on, right? And then the last thing that I would suggest, especially if you're working on something like that, um, is to have a daily mission. And this again comes out of sports psychology. You know, baseball players or basketball players would be, okay, your mission today is to do X, right? Or maybe X and Y kind of thing. So to bring this back to trading, um, if my, if I'm working on a good clean entry and not jumping in, you know, a little prematurely and waiting for that. So my daily mission might be a very short and it's good to keep these short brief sentences and only one or two. You don't want to be working on multiple things at once. Just one or two things is fine. So my daily mission might be be patient, wait for the trigger. Right. So that is kind of reinforcing what I'm working on and I'm bringing it into my trading day in that way with a clear mind and a, a spacious mind. Hopefully. I'm just, um, I'm getting giddy over here about everything that you're saying. I, I, uh, I coach my son's baseball team. He's 11. And one thing that we started doing last year was on our way to a, a baseball game or a tournament, I would have him close his eyes and he's a pitcher pitcher pitching hitting and he plays center field so i had him go through all three of those in his mind rehearsing so say say he was re rehearsing his hitting he would actually you know be up at bat he would be visualizing the pitcher he would see the ball come out of the pitcher's hand he would hear the bat hitting the ball he would watch it fly over the outfielder's head you know or if it was a or if he was pitching he would hear the ball hit his catcher's mitt you know, he would, you know, just very visual. And it, it was so amazing, the level of his game, how it how it took off. Um, and, you know, there's practice and there's a whole lot of things that go into it. But I still think that that rehearsal in his mind of being very visual with with those with those different aspects of his game helped take his game to a new level. So I, I just I yeah. love it. Yeah, absolutely. And that and that's a nice little story um, showing how this stuff does work. And think about it on the flip side. If we don't do things like that and we just allow the mind to go off on its own and we listen to it and we and it, as your as your it was your son that you were coaching, right? Mm -hmm. As your son noticed, he could he could hear the ball coming into the mitt. He could hear the crack of the bat. He could see it going over the top. It's the same thing. If we rehearse in that way, it becomes very powerful. But if we don't do that and we just allow the mind to go on on its own, we connect in with whatever the mind is saying just the same way that your son connected in with hearing the ball hit the mitt and hearing the crack of the bat. It's this we you know, it's as strong and as powerful as that. So we don't want to do this randomly. We want to have it structured for ourselves so that we do build skills. That's the important thing. Yeah, I, I agree. Not only are you training your mind and directing your mind at what you want to do, so it doesn't direct it, direct you to do something that you don't want, but it also, you can, you almost are tricking the mind. The, your mind doesn't know the difference between your mental reps and actually doing it exactly. in real life. And so it's like, it's like he's 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 getting a lot more reps in just by visualizing it, same, similar that he does in practice, right? Yeah. One of the strongest methodologies that we have in psychology is known as exposure. This was developed with people with post-traumatic stress disorder, mostly combat veterans coming out of Vietnam and, and uh, the other wars that we've fought. 
um, and just being totally anxious and, 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 you know, hardly able to function in a, in a day to day life. And um, oh, I'm blanking on what I was going to say. What was I going to say here? Ha, I got lost. Sorry about that. There we go. There's the mind for you. Right? <laughs> That's right. Your mind took over and then, you know, you weren't, uh, you weren't controlling it. It just controlled you, right? Yeah, I, I do remember. So, the, you know, the mind is really great at problem solving. You know, if we were, I don't know, stuck on a road, this is in my book, if we ran out of gas and there was no town or gas station and the cell phone was out and we look in the back we grab out the, the flashlight from the glove box and we look in the back and we see a pen and we notice that the um, fuel is leaking out of the fuel stop. Well, we can take that pen and break it apart and s slip it in between the, the, um, you know, the fuel line and, and solve the problem that way. The mind is really good for that. We don't even need those. We don't need the pen or the gas line or we can figure it out in our head. We can see it in our head, in our head without having to be there. Very powerful, right? But the flip side of that is that that can be used against you because it is, we do believe what we're imagining in our head. We do believe what we're thinking. We're, we do it uncritically. We don't question it. And because of that, it creates all kinds of problems in trading, all kinds of problems. And mindfulness, as I say, is the number one thing to begin to see this and to begin to have a different relationship with your thoughts and your feelings. We can't change thoughts, right? We can't say, I'm not going to have that thought because we will. It just pops up. We, I've been doing psychology since uh, almost 30 years now, and I've never met a single person who can control their thoughts or control their emotions consistently. Never met a single person who could do that, hmm. you know, and if that's the case, then we need to, you know, the idea that we need to be robotic and not have emotions and not pay attention to our, that's nuts. We're going to, that's going to create all kinds of problems for us. We need a different relationship with our thoughts and our feelings. And that's why starting to learn to hold them out here at arm's length is so important. That's amazing. I, I, I could, I could just talk for an hour on this on this topic alone um but let, let's let's jump on let's move on to part two of your seven part series your seven part guide okay part two is plan your trade and trade your plan we've 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 heard we've all heard that as traders but tell us what that means from your perspective so what do i think about that you need a good process in trading I kind of alluded to it earlier when I was talking about uh, the process of, of um, high quality preparation, and I have a little routine there that I follow. But your trading plan is also really your process. It details the markets you're going to trade, the time frames, the setups, and so on and so forth, right? And it sets us up for focusing on a, on a process of trading. What, when we're thinking about trading, we're really operating in a probabilistic field, right? Every trade setup that we have has a probability of winning, but it also has a certain probability of losing. You know, a good trade setup might have 40%, uh, I'm sorry, 60% winners and 40% losers. And many traders, especially novice traders, they want every trade to be a winner. And that's just not possible. There's a paradox, if you will, in this, and that is that when we put on a trade, any individual trade, we never know if it's going to be a winner or a loser. But over a large number of trades, if we have a 60% edge of winning and it produces, you know, some number of points on average, then that edge should play out over that large number of trades. But when we're thinking about outcomes, right, as opposed to process, that's where we start to get stuck on the wrong side of this paradox. We want every trade to be a winning trade rather than, you know, 60-40 kind of thing or 65-35, something like that. When we do that, we're just thinking about we want wins, we want wins, we want wins. We get, we, we let that process go. We forget about our trade plan. We forget about setting a stop maybe, or maybe we move a stop away because we don't want to take a loss, 
right? Or maybe we didn't set a stop and now we're averaging down as the market's coming against us. We're adding to our position because we figure, oh yeah, if we, you know, one, as soon as this thing pulls back, I can get out at break even. All of those things. That's all outcome thinking. That's not your trading plan, right? That's not your trading plan. Your plan is your process. And you want to be true to that, not be focused on outcomes, but be focused on the probabilities of your trade setup and trying to get that as high up there as you can within reason. So when I look at the trading plan, you know, a lot of traders either don't have one, novice traders or new traders either don't have one or wrote one and then put it on the shelf. It really needs to be a living, breathing document because those losses that we had, what we ought to do with those, and this is also should be part of your plan and should be part of your process. You should be looking at those at the end of the day and saying and, and figuring out why did this trade fail? Why didn't it why didn't it work out? Was it market conditions that weren't favorable for this? You know, some trades are great when the market is trending, but not so great when it's in consolidation, right? So was it market conditions or maybe price action or something there that 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 maybe I can learn something about this trade and I can improve my probabilities by doing so. Right. But most traders or many traders, I shouldn't say most, many traders have a bad habit of wanting to sweep their losses under the rug. I don't want to look at them just get them away from me, I, you know, kind of thing. I, I can't, I can't see them. And the reason is, is because it, it, you know, it brings, regurgitates really the bad feelings that they had when they were in the trade. And if they were following the process and not averaging down or moving their stops and what have you, they wouldn't feel such, such, such uncomfortable feelings. But adopting a probabilistic mindset, understanding that your plan is your process, and when you do have losing trades, use that process to figure out how to improve your trading results and your trade setups uh, and your overall skills at reading the market from market conditions. So the plan, I think the plan is really crucial. People who don't trade with, with it, with a, without people who trade without a plan generally don't do as well as people who do trade with a plan. And I had to, I personally had to take it to uh, even one step further what I would find is I, you know, I had my plan, I would evaluate it after at the end of the day or after I was done trading. And, you know, invariably there were things that I was like, why did I do that? You know, that kind of thing. And so I actually, what helped me even, even take that even one step further was, and I still do it every single day today to, to make sure that I don't get off track is I have an Apple watch and there's a little timer on there. And every 30 minutes, it goes off, it vibrates. Mm -hmm. And so what do I, so I have a very specific thing at every 30 minutes, I take a couple deep breaths. I tell myself either out loud or at least in my mind that my goal is to follow my trading plan. My goal is the process. My goal is not to make money. My goal is not the outcome. My goal is the plan. So it's right in line with, with what you're saying, but to me, if I only, and this is just me, but if I only waited till after I was done trading, I would still find myself making these stupid mistakes over and over and over. And so mm -hmm. for me, I have to have an, an even more uh, frequent reminder to make sure I am following the process. Right. That's really good in a number of ways. But basically what you're doing is, is you're evaluating yourself as you go along and you say, you know, I can't do this at the end of the day. That's too too long and I and I'm vulnerable to doing it again, maybe multiple times before the end of the day occurs. So I really need to do it, you know, every 30 minutes or so. That's that's terrific. You figured out a pattern in your own performance, right? And you figured out a way to deal with it. You've understood that it was limiting you in some way. And so you said, okay, how can I overcome this? Well, if I do this, then that's a step towards overcoming it. And you learn how to, you know, as you go forward, you learn how to add other things to it. And suddenly what was a limit for you no longer is. And that's how we do, that's trading psychology in a nutshell right there. 
Very cool. It's very cool. An example of it. Yeah. All right. So part three is sharpen your trading performance edge by maintaining a trading journal. I oh, yeah. talk about this. My community is probably sick about me talking about trading journals, but <laughs> it's that important. Talk about trading journals. Oh, yeah, it really is. Um, they're so useful. So when I think about a trading journal, certainly there's the how many wins did I have and how much money did I make or lose and how many points or pips and all of that sort of stuff. There's that part, but I'll focus on the more mental side of it, the more psychological side of it. And you don't it doesn't have to be real sophisticated. Just get a notebook and use that. Or if you want to type it into um, the computer, that's good, too. It's helpful to print out charts from time to time and, and, and mark up charts and include those in your journal. But really, it comes down to three questions. What did I do well today? Where did I fall short? And what can I do about it? Right? We want to know what we do well, because that's what we can rely on. If we're really good at, I don't know, holding a trade to its profit target, which a lot of folks have difficulty doing, but let's say we're good at that, that we know that we can bank on that. We know we can rely on that. We don't have to think too much about how to deal with you know, as price is moving up and it starts ticking against us, what we do with that. That's not our issue. We're strong in that department. We don't have to worry about that. So that's important to know your own personal. This is your personal awareness of, of where you are strong and where you have limits. Notice I don't say weak because most of the time we don't really have weaknesses. We just come run up to our limitation. And if we get caught in mental, you know, emotional hijacking when we're so full of fear and we're making mistake after mistake after mistake in our trading and it costs us money and all of that, it's not a weakness for us. It's actually every human being experiences this and every trader has experienced this and many continue to experience this. And, the, and they're not flawed, they're not psychologically disordered or psychiatrically compromised or anything like that. They're just stuck in an unhelpful way of operating. So we don't want to be, you know, don't say, oh, I've got a weakness and I can never overcome it. We want to know what those limitations are. And we want to know two things about those limitations. Is this really impacting my trading? Right. If I'm if I'm not good at holding a position, then that's that's something that I want to change, right? If it's something that I can avoid, like a particular trade setup that occurs um, maybe in a certain kind of market condition, and I know when that market condition uh, uh, shows up, I don't want to make this trade. Well, I can avoid that. I don't have to work on making that trade better. I can just forget about that totally. It's always easier to avoid something if we can rather than to change it. But when we have a limitation and we recognize it as an important limitation that's limiting our performance in trading, then we want to work on that. We want to think about, just as you did um, in that example that you, you talked about, Steve, just take one or two steps in the direction of, of solving that issue for yourself. How do, I, how do I strengthen that? How do I overcome this? And just start working on that and develop a routine for it. You can imagine it in your pre-trading routine. You can have a mission statement about it and all of that. And that will give you some momentum to work towards that. But yeah, that's excellent. Journal. I think, um, in fact, I just did a recent uh, podcast episode about this where I talked about keeping a mindset journal. And, I, you know, it doesn't need to be a separate deal. Like you said, it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be a notepad. It could be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be whatever you want. But we always, you know, your methodology, trading price action and volume and the methodology, price, you know, term uh, uh, market structure, you've found patterns in the, the market that give you an edge. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the 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 idea of when you're keeping your trading journal, not just to keep your time you got in and the P&L and all that stuff, but also to have a heavy emphasis on the mental state or the, 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 the mindfulness of the trades that you are in is because we have emotional 
We have mental patterns. And if you can identify the kind of exactly what you're saying, if you can identify those patterns of yourself, then that's going to create an edge as well. So I, I think that's, that's so powerful because so many, especially newer traders, they focus on the strategy or they focus on the indicator they're using or whatever it is. Right. And it's the it's the mental part and the the mental patterns that you continue to do well or not do well that can actually make the biggest difference. Yep, absolutely. One client I have, I work with some traders one on one on their mental game. So one one comes to mind. He pretty good trader can put together 18, 19, 20 days in a row of profitability, right? Day trading. Uh, he's trading um, one of the, I guess, the NASDAQ, into the NQ, the, the uh, NAS 100 uh, futures. So he puts it, he can put that together, but then he gives it all back in one or two days. I've done that a and couple of times. Yeah. And so this is a pattern that, come, that comes about, and he discovered this by maintaining a journal. And, you know, don't just write down in a journal. You've got to review it every so often, too, periodically. I like to kind of review the week or often a month is a good time to go back and review um, what you wrote in your in your journal and look for patterns like this. But anyway, he found a pattern. He found this pattern. And what it was, was he was feeling so good about himself. Hey, I put together 20 days in a row. I'm, I'm on a roll here. I'm hot. He feels invincible and he starts letting his guard down. Well, you know, it doesn't quite meet my criteria, but I'm so I'm doing so good. It's OK. Or, or the better one is um, I hear this a lot from other traders it, more than this. Just this fellow has this is a very common pattern. Trader will say, well, now I made so much money on those other. I'm playing with house money. Ooh, that's a... <laughs> yeah. So it's OK. Ooh, to, that just okay made my whole body tense up when you said that. Cause I, yeah. I've heard that many times. So we actually have a term in psychology for this. It's called moral licensing. It has to do with the recency effect where recent events um, kind of weigh heavily on our cognitive, on our thinking, and, um, and, the, and, and they influence our, our behavior and our actions. Well, moral licensing is um, exactly that, where we've had good positive um, uh, results uh, in the recent past, and we're feeling really good. In fact, we're feeling invincible. We're so we're feeling so good, and that causes us to let our guard down, and to not be vigilant, and to take unqualified trades, and to do bad things. And then you know we lose the money that we made, and we get caught in that kind of a cycle unless we break out of it. So yeah, that's an interesting way to to use the journal. Very useful way to use the journal. Great. All right, part four of your seven part guide, trading with your mind in the moment. What do you mean by that? Well, this is where mindfulness really, really comes into play because we can, I'll give you a good example. I'll bet every trader has had this experience. And this is a, like, a, like a strong emotional experience. So we get into a trade, let's say we get into a long trade and we have a profit objective of, I don't know, eight, 10 points to the north of us. And we've got maybe two or three points in the trade, profitable. And it starts ticking against us, maybe a half a point, a point, somewhere around there. And the mind starts kicking in. Oh, Gary, you better take that trade off. You wanna book that, pro you don't wanna have losses here. That's never Let's happened get... to me. No, never, right? <laughs> and. I probably would fight it a little bit. Now I'm starting to live and die on every tick, every up and down tick, right? And it starts to pull back. Maybe it goes a point and a quarter or a point and a half. And now my mind is screaming at me, get out of the damn trade, hurry up, right? And so I exit. And what happens? I feel good. I feel relief. All that pressure that I was feeling is now off of me. But then what happens? Most of the time, or many times, the trade pulls back a little bit and then pushes on up and goes right up to our eight or 10 point profit target, right? Now, what's the mind telling us this time? Well, if it's, if your mind is like my mind, here's what my mind would be saying. Gary, you idiot, what are you doing that again for? Are you stupid or what? 
Are you never going to learn this? You're never going to, you ought to just forget this stuff. You're never going to be a trader, right? Common experience. We all have had this multiple times, but we never ask an important question. And that question is, so which mind was right? Was it the mind telling us to get out of the trade a few moments ago? Or is it the mind now yelling at us, chastising us for doing exactly what it told us to do a few moments ago? Right. Right. And you can apply this to, you know, just about jumping into trades. Oh, the market's going to take off. You better get in. You're going to have so many profits. You're going to miss out on those profits. So you jump in. The market goes down, stops you out. What an idiot. Are you never going to learn? The thing we never do is ask that question. Well, this is about the mind being in the moment, being in the present moment, is being able to, again, not buying into, not seeing through the world through these thoughts, like I'm going to have a loss, I better get out, hurry up, or you idiot, why did you do that? That's this. We got to bring these out here. And that's what I mean by being in the present moment, to recognize those thoughts just as thoughts, even though they're tinged with emotion, charged with emotion, even though they sound true, even though we believe them. We have to learn to hold them lightly, to hold them lightly. Otherwise, we're going to just be whipsawed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth by whatever whim the mind is, is conjuring up at the moment. So that's what I mean by being, having your mind in the moment. So which one was right? <laughs> they're, they're both wrong. <laughs> that's the thing, right? Right. Neither one is right. They're both wrong. You should have stayed in and, you know, you shouldn't be, they should, shouldn't be yelling at you for doing what it told you to do. That fear and greed, they're powerful. Yeah. Yep. But heads a lot. Yeah, and it, it really comes down to, I think Mark Douglas said this, who wrote an excellent book, by the way. He was not a psychologist, but he was, he was a very good trader, and he was very interested in psychology and learned a lot about it and wrote pretty cogently, I thought, and pretty clearly in his book. But he said that very, very clearly, too. That was, you know, the, most, of our, most of our emotions, we have fear, greed, and hope, Really, it's fear, the fear of missing out, the fear of being wrong, the fear of leaving money on the table. And there's one other fear, fear of loss. Right. And hope is just hoping we're not going to have to book that fearful loss that we're having. And greed is just the fear of really missing out or leaving money on the table. That, it's all about fear as I see it. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could probably recite trading in the zone word for word. I I've read it so many times. So yeah, great stuff. It's an excellent book. It's a really it's the one book outside of my own that I recommend to uh, to other traders as a really good trading psych book. I think it's excellent and it was really well written. Yeah, agreed. All right, part five, mentally parking losses and errors. What do you mean by that? Well, that's a it's a good skill to develop mental parking. If we were in a nine to five job in a corporation somewhere in suburbia, say, and we had to drive to get there, we'd get in our car in the morning, drive to the office, park it in the parking lot or the car park or garage, whatever. And we'd lock it up probably and go into the office. Wouldn't think about it the whole day. Right. We didn't drag the car into the office and keep it right next to the desk. Oh, there's my nice car there. We don't need to do that. We can leave it in the. And when we're ready to go home at five or six o'clock at night, remember, this is a corporate job that we all try to leave right? or are trying to leave. Um, we, the car is still there for us and we get in, we can use it and do that. So that's the concept of mental parking. When we have a loss, the best thing to do is to write it down, you know, write in your journal, a three point or a four point loss or whatever it was at this time. And you just close the book on it and you park it to later until later. OK, now is not the time to deal with it. We do that after trading is over. 
Same thing with other distractions. Um, we were talking about preparation um, earlier. Let's say we had a fight with our partner or our spouse. And um, this happens with a lot of traders. They bring it into trading, not consciously maybe, but they bring it into, into trading. They're still thinking about what they want to say to their wife or their husband or their partner and how much they're wrong. And if they only saw things their way, it would be so much better, right? They're still fighting that fight. They haven't parked it. And then what normally happens on something like that, when we're distracted that way, it affects our trading. We take poor trades or we don't, you know, revent, you know I'm angry now at my, my uh, spouse and now I take that out on the market. It's easy for us to do. So mental parking is something that we see it in sport all the time. I'm a big tennis fan and um, <clears throat> I would watch um, Roger Federer when he made an error, an unforced error, right? Made a, made a foolish play. But he'd call the ball boy over and get a ball from them. And he'd kind of look at the ball, he'd gaze at it. And then he'd take his racket and he'd hit it across, you know, down, down court and hit it away. You'll often see a pitcher on a base, in a baseball mound if he threw a ball, if he threw a bad ball, an errant ball you'll see him kind of look down to the ground and grind his foot into the dirt. Well, he's mentally placing, just like Federer was mentally placing his error on that tennis ball and then hitting it away. The pitcher is placing it down in the dirt and then rubbing his foot into it to grind it away, right? That's mental parking. The basic idea is that any distraction that we have, we want to recognize it, and if it's an important distraction, like if it's an argument with somebody important to us, or if it's a loss that we had that we want to take a look at later, we can jot it down, close the cover, park it, and then deal with it later. That's the idea behind mental parking. I, I, love, good... I, love the, I love the way that you phrase that as parking. Because what we're not doing, because if, you're, if you park your car in a garage, you're, you're going back to get it, right? you're not throwing it out, <laughs> right? So there's a, there's a big difference between taking something and ignoring it and putting it, you know, sweeping it under the rug until it builds up a big pile of whatever. And there's a bit, so there's a big difference between ignoring it and parking it. And parking it. Because you're always going back to get your car out of the parking lot. You're always going back to it. It's just taking it, compartmentalizing it for later, right? For later, exactly. It's not going away. Right. You, st you, you still will deal with it. But at the moment, this is not the time to be dealing with that. We have other things to do. I've got tr trading to deal with. I've got to identify and execute trades. That's my job at the moment. And I can't have distractions. That's where mental parking comes in. Excellent. I love that. I've never, I've never heard it explained that way. I love that. Uh, part six of seven attending to the trading process, not results. We kind of touched on this before, but, but uh, hit on that again. Yeah, there was a really good, um, it was an unpublished study that was done, uh, some cognitive psychologists a while ago. And they, t they talked about this. And one of the things they said is that when you have a winning trade and you followed your process, well, that's expected, right? We, we would expect a, a win to come mo most of the time or a majority of the time uh, when we followed our plan and when we followed our process. When we have a losing trade and we followed our process, that was too bad. That's just part of the probability curve. It's just bad luck, right? We, didn't, we weren't lucky. We were unlucky here. Um, and, and, and so that's following the process. When we don't have a process and we have a winning trade, well, gee, anybody can put a trade on. And, you know, if it goes in your direction, great. That's a winning trade. That's just dumb luck. If you're not following a process and you have a winning trade, you're trading basically randomly and you just had a positive random outcome. That's just dumb luck. When you're not following a process, 
and you have a losing trade, that's justified. You should have that. That's expected. That's poetic justice, if you want. So when we think about a process, we have winning trades and we have losing trades. When we follow a process, we have that's the expected. That's what we um, are expecting from, from that process. There are times, however, when it doesn't work out, we accept that because that's just, we, we were just unlucky there. And it's part of, part of the trade setup as it is. If we're not following a process, even if we have a win, that's just dumb luck. And most of the time we're gonna get nicked, we're gonna have losses, and that is deserved for not following a process. So that's kind of process in a nutshell. Yeah. And I, th I think uh, the other thing that I see with traders who don't have a process is uh, when they when they have winning trades, especially if it's multiple in a row or if it's a big one, then they're a genius, right? <laughs> it was them. It was, it was their knowledge or their research or their analysis that, that created that win. And when it when they lose, it was somebody else's fault or it was, was the that? market's fault or it was the stock's fault. Uh, fault or, or whatever. So, so yeah, I mean, you can, you can get in, even if you don't think about those things consciously on a subconscious level, sometimes that creeps into your mind. But when you have the process, it's hard for that to happen because it's a process. Because it's a process, right? And a process, you know, when we're talking about a probabilistic field, like, like trading, it, it, that's all you've got. If you don't follow the process, you don't let your edge play out. Whatever edge you've got in your trade setups, that's not going to play out if you're not following a process. Because if you get a winning trade, that's just dumb luck. And most of the time, you're not going to have a winning trade. And that's what you expect. You have to have a process. You have to follow that process for the probabilities to be realized. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Gary, number seven of seven, reviewing seven of seven. the day for self-improvement. Talk about that. Yeah, we kind of touched on this a little bit. And this, and, and sorry to cut you off, and, and this ties into the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about anyway is one of the other uh, documents or tools that you, that you have on your site is the Trader's Performance Assessment. And I think that's what you're just getting. Right. It's, it's really four basic questions, and I think that's where, you're, where you were going. Right, right. What, are, what, what, did, what were my strong points today? What were my limitations today? What can I learn about myself and my trading and my performance, my trading performance? A lot of times traders don't realize that they're in control of their performance, right? They think that they put on a trade and they're not really part of the process any longer. They're totally in, in it. And it's really, how are you performing? You know, <clears throat> you can take a trade setup that has a certain edge to it and you can give it to two different people and you can give them the same market data, in fact, and tell them to trade and trade only that trade setup and they're going to have different results. And it's based on their performance, how they're performing with that particular trade setup. So um, we want to we want to pay attention to that. We want to be looking for patterns, as we've talked about so far in this conversation about, um, you know, things like having a multiple number of wins or good outsized wins and then um, letting our guard down and, and giving it back or giving a portion of it back. Those kinds of patterns are really useful. Those are the things that we can learn about ourselves when we practice using a journal, when we do this constructive self-assessment at the end of the trading day, or if you're a swing trader at the end of the week or the end of the trade, whatever. And then what can you do with what you've learned? And I like to set up what we call SMART goals, S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So if I was, for example, let's use the example of, um, of um, uh, getting in the trade too early and not waiting for a good trigger. So now I've done my research and I've got a good trigger, right? Um, a good entry trigger, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So I'm going to set up a SMART goal. I'm going to make it very specific and measurable, um, attainable, relevant, and time-framed or time-bound. So I'm going to say, over the next two weeks, for example, I'm going to take 70% of my entry trigger uh, for every trade that sets up, right? And that's my SMART goal. It's very specific. 
I can measure it. Usually we measure, did I do it? Did I not do it? Is it attainable? I gave myself a, a, a kind of a psychological outer cover. I just give myself, you know, 70%. I don't have to have 100%. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for momentum, right? To start pulling myself in a given direction. Um, it's certainly relevant to my trading because if I can get a good entry, then I've reduced my stress and I've reduced some losses. And I've time bound it over the next two weeks. I'm going to do this on every trade. So that's kind of a we don't have a lot of time to talk in, a, in an hour's interview about this stuff, unfortunately. Um, but that's kind of a preview about how I would work with somebody using their um, using those questions and they discover something in their performance that they're not doing that they want to improve on. It's a limit that's relevant to their trading. And if they changed it, it would improve their trading. And the way I would do it is I'd set up a specific kind of goal called the SMART goal, and I'd set it up in that specific way so that we don't have to hit perfection, but we want to gain momentum in that direction. Wow. That, that, that's great stuff. Um, man, I, I love, love, love this conversation. I love, I love your whole approach. I love everything you're, you're talking about here. It's, it's so much in line with, with what I believe, what I feel, how I, how I operate and how I, how I talk to our, our folks as well. So Gary, I, I really enjoyed the conversation to be uh, conscious of your time. We'll go ahead and, and, um, end it here, but anything else you want to tell the trade hacker community before we say goodbye? <laughs> just focus on the mental side. Look, trading is really difficult. You're up against the best players in the world. Some of the best and brightest in the world are operating in the markets day to day, and you're, you're working against them. So you really want to focus on the mental side. It's not so much the technical. I mean, even Mark Douglas said this. I can, if you send me your e well, letter, I think at the time that he wrote his book, but if you send me a letter, I'll send you a trade setup that has a good edge to it. And you can, it's not so much the technical side. There's probably a million ways to trade the market, if not more. And they're, they can all be workable and valuable and, and usable and profitable, right? It's not so much that. It's what's going on in here between the ears. And uh, it's it's a you know it's 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 pretty huge it's vast, but we can also start to work with it and start to learn about the mind and how it works and how not to be obedient to it all the time, which is what gets people into so much trouble. So that would be my message: is focus a lot on the mental side um, and trade well. Yeah. Well, great, great stuff. If uh, if anyone wants to learn more about Gary and, and kind of the stuff he's doing, tradingpsychologyedge.com is his website. The seven part guide to mental trading skills that we just went over today. Uh, you can get access to that in a seven day email series along with the trader's performance assessment document. So with that, Gary, we'll say goodbye. Thank you so much for being on the show and maybe we can do it again in the future. Oh, I'd love to. This was a great great time. I really appreciate it, Steve. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye now.